Hi, my name is Guy Wallace, and in this PAC video short, we're going to discuss project planning for the PAC processes, including the project plans and proposals, should they be necessary in your context. PAC is an acronym. It stands for Performance Space, Accelerated, Customer and Stakeholder Driven, Training and Development of Any Blend. In the PAC processes, we produce both project plans and proposals. In your situational context, the project plan may be necessary, but maybe not to the level of depth that we will be discussing that in this video. You may or may not need a project proposal depending on your situation as well. The detailed project plan, which I prefer because I want to know the details myself, I may show the client something less than the detailed plan, but in my back pocket, so to speak, I'll have the details of the plan so that I can be more predictive of the schedule adherence, the burden on any of the participants of the project plan, all the tasks, and all the costs that are going to be incurred in conducting a project, whether that project be a curriculum architecture design project, or a modular curriculum development project, or an instructional activity development project. The project plan with the details has eight parts, a purpose, a background, the scope, the approach that's going to be used, project phases and milestones, outputs and deliverables, roles and responsibilities, and then the task charts, the schedule for going forward and doing the project. The purpose is pretty simple. It simply describes in a sentence or two, why are we doing this? What's the purpose? The second section of the project plan, the background, explains why are we doing this now? Third, the scope sets the limitations of the project. It says what's in the box, what's perhaps borderline on the edges of the box, but what also is excluded from the project, what is outside the box. This is necessary in order to manage expectations for all of the people that might be involved in the project. You simply don't want to find out six months into something, six weeks into something, that you're missing the mark and that you should have included somebody that you were thinking was to be excluded from the project. It's better to clarify this up front and get that squared away immediately. What approaches are going to be used in the project? Will you be using surveys or not? Will you be doing interviews or not? Will you be doing observations of people performing or not? Will you be doing document reviews or not? Will you be facilitating group meetings of master performers and subject matter experts and novice performers and managers and supervisors or not? This gets articulated in the section four of the detailed project plan. In section five, we identify what phases and milestones we're going to be using to structure the project. In six, we define specifically the outputs and deliverables at a great level of detail. What are the clients going to get for this effort? What are the deliverables in the context of the phases and milestones? What kind of level of depth of information might one find in these outputs? Will there be things at a very high level initially getting greater and greater detail as we go along? Or will there be great detail in the very first iteration of some content that's produced as a result of this project? Section seven identifies all the various roles in the project and their responsibilities. Is there a client project manager as well as a supplier project manager? What are their responsibilities specifically. This role clarity here helps answer questions as people are brought into the project and they want to know who is supposed to do what and when are they supposed to do it. When they are supposed to do it is articulated in section 8, the project and tasks and roles schedule. Here is an example of that. Here are the project tasks for some phase and here are some of the roles on the Epic Incorporated side, the supply side, and then, then the TMC side, that's the customer side. We can articulate who's involved in task number one and how much time are they going to spend in that. In task two, who's involved? 
And how much time will each of the roles spend in that? We can see that in task two, GW is going to spend a quarter of a day. Whereas on the client side, TMC Corporation, the project manager there is going to spend one day. Now these are estimates. And as I tell clients, these are all plus or minus 25%. Every number on this is wrong, but in the aggregate, we hope to be within 10 or 15%. And then the schedule columns on the far right are where we schedule key tasks. I don't, in my practice in project planning, schedule every task. I schedule all the meetings, and then all the work that gets done in between the key meetings of a project are left to the micro-scheduling of the practitioners doing the project. They might be doing more than one project at a time, and they need to kind of balance that out themselves. But I don't schedule each and every task in a project, just the key tasks. In a curriculum architecture design project, we use these four phases to structure the overall project. This can change. There have been times when the analysis and design phase were put together into one phase simply because there was only going to be one gate review meeting, which is what the upside down traffic lights represent. Those, by the way, are not stop lights. Those are go lights, and that's why they're upside down. In an MCD modular curriculum development project, we use a six phase structure typically, and you'll see the gate review meetings that are planned for that effort. MCD projects can be also reconfigured. In this next example, you see that phase two and three have been combined with only one gate review meeting. This has got to be a conscious decision on behalf of the suppliers and the customers in a collaborative planning effort. What's the damage that can be done if we do analysis and go right to design without checking in with the client and making sure that the analysis data is correct? is what we want it to be leading into the future. Does it reflect too much of the old school methods and not enough of the new approaches that the client is wishing for? That's what has to be safeguarded against. In this next example, we also combine phases two and three and we skip the pilot test. We maintain the phase numbers, even if we skip a phase, so that somebody might ask, well, why are you going from phase four to phase six? It's because we've made a deliberate decision to skip the pilot test. If we had done 27 different projects like this in the past, and the client feels that we are pretty much guaranteed good to go, that we can do our analysis and our design, and then develop and acquire the content, and then ship it. There won't be any revision. We'll just release it. We'll put it in the LMS, we'll put it in the LCMS, we'll put it in the file cabinets, we'll ship it to everybody, however it was intended to be deployed. But the client might deem that it's not worthy of the effort and there's low risk involved in conducting a pilot test. So the flexibility can be maintained here. You don't always have to pilot test. We just think it's a good practice and a best practice most of the time. But as always, it depends. ISD development ratios are used in my world to forecast the amount of touch time that's required task by task by task. I've been collecting data at the phase level in terms of how much time myself, my staff, puts into these kinds of projects so that I have good heuristics in order to guide future planning. I know how much time, close enough, is going to be expended by each person doing each task, each role doing each task. Plus or minus 25%, I can hit that number with great confidence. I can also estimate for the client side how much time they're going to spend in them doing the tasks. What is their touch time? Once you know what all the touch times are and can add those up, you can calculate a reasonable cycle time in order to allow all that touch time to happen. If there's four days of touch time, perhaps four days of cycle time is too risky. What if something goes wrong and it slips? Maybe I need to give six business days for four days of touch time. 
in order to make sure that I can hit all my milestones and that I don't have slippage. The teams involved in a pack project vary by curriculum architecture design to modular curriculum design and development. There is some variance in the teams that are involved in curriculum architecture design, modular curriculum development, and instructional activity development, although MCD and IED are mirrors of each other. There's a project steering team. They own the project. We're all working for them. They make all the final business decisions. They can approve or reverse any of the instructional design decisions that are made in the context of any of these projects because, as we said, we're working for them. They live with the consequences of the right decisions and the wrong decisions. Our meeting with them in our gate review meetings gives us a forum in which to discuss the pros and cons, what the research says, what we believe is good versus bad, but in the end result, the client gets to make the decision because they live with the consequences of those decisions. An analysis team defines the performance requirements and all of the enabling knowledge and skills. Analysis teams are most often populated with master performers, people performing at a level of mastery the day before they come into the project. We might also include on the analysis team other subject matter experts, people working on new IT systems that will be rolling out soon, or people who are on the customer end of things downstream, or suppliers who are working with us or upstream from us and need to understand this work, this performance that we're going to be focusing on. There's a design team then, which is typically a subset of the analysis team or just the whole analysis team. At that point, we don't want any new players on a design team because they will tend to want to reinvent, reconfigure, restructure, rename all of the analysis data. So it's best to use people who generated that analysis data and understand it inside and out and understand the nuances and understand the trade-offs that were made when we decided to call it this versus that. An implementation planning team is used just in the curriculum architecture design projects. They take all the gaps from the training and development path, all of the gaps because courses, the events, and the modules within the events are non-existent or they partially exist. We might have content that we can use after modification, but that modification is a future work project. And so that competes with the total gaps for the time and attention and funding and resources post-curriculum architecture design. Somebody needs to make the business decisions as to what's really important, what's really critical, what's going to have a real return on investment. The development teams are not in the curriculum architecture design project because a curriculum architecture design project does not produce any new content. It simply identifies the need, determines what content exists and can be used as is or after modification or not at all. And the development teams then are part of the MCD and IAD worlds. These are teams of instructional designers and developers, as well as master performers and subject matter experts, the people that are brought together to actually produce the good content, instruction and information. The pilot test team is a combination of target audience. The pilot test team is a combination of target audience representatives, as well as management representatives or management spies. Target audience members can't tell you whether the content is accurate, complete, or appropriate, but you can use them to measure learning. The management representatives can tell you whether your content is accurate, complete, and appropriate, but you can't measure learning with them because theoretically they already know it. The ISD team is a support to these customer teams. They are on these teams, but they are also separate from these teams. When they sit in a team meeting, an analysis team meeting, or a design team meeting, 
when they sit in an analysis team or a design team meeting or an implementation planning team meeting, they are non-voting members. They don't live with the consequences of the decisions, ultimately. Therefore, they don't have a vote. My suggestion regarding project plans and proposals and formats is to use a format that's already familiar to your project steering team. Don't give them a new format and make them learn how that works. You need to learn what their format is, what they already use, and adapt to that. Show the level of detail that the project steering team likes. If you like to do more details and they don't want to look at all those details, then show them a higher level view of your plan. Simply have the details in your back pocket, so to speak, in case they challenge anything about your plan, and then you can show them that you've done your homework, that you've done this at a greater level of detail, and you've saved them from having to look at all of it. I've been practicing, publishing, and presenting on these methods since 1982. My recent book, Six Pack, covers all of this in great detail.